passion and bravery to write new rules. A place that shows the world the courage, creativity, and compassion of the man named Jesus. A place that has Christ-centered, multi-ethnic, and innovative faith communities that extend throughout the world. A place that stands on the mandate, engage God, people, and culture. A place that pushes the status quo, a place that faces challenges each day, and a place that will have the courage and hope to lead the nation into the promised land. The same promised land of reconciliation that Dr. King saw from the mountaintop. A place that has the audacity to follow God, no matter the circumstance. I see a place where the hopeless find hope and where the broken are made whole, a place where people have searched exhaustively for purpose, find it, and are launched into it. A place like Bethlehem, which seemingly had little to offer but birthed the hope of the world. We are this place that I envision. We are the bricks and the blocks and the stones of this place. Christ is our foundation. We are the place that launches thousands of leaders into every sphere of influence of society. A place which will be on the forefront, leading a global movement of culture creators. We are in the place that will be innovative and creative with every building and in every space. A place where its locations will be a blessing, not only to the church, but to the cities it dwells in. We see a place that makes Jesus the main attraction, where he is shown off to the world. We are the place I envision. This is our declaration. It started with such faith, such anticipation, such vision, and as we celebrate this life and legacy, did we do it? Is the evidence of our commitment to God visible? Is the evidence of our abandonment to his will visible? Have we become the place we envision? Or would we have fallen short? What did our life, what did our legacy speak of? And did it speak in such a way that an impact is projected and to carry into the future? And you, what about you? If the date was 50 or 75 years from now, will your life Speak of the ways you hoped, the ways you loved. Will others be able to tell the ways you risked it all, recklessly? Abandon to the calling God placed on your life. Will the next generation be able to examine your history and see this one, this one, trusted the Lord. This one knew the faithfulness of God. The God of peace made them holy in every way, and their whole spirit and soul was kept blameless until the Lord Jesus came again. God brought everything to completion since he who called is faithful. And the final act, what will your life speak of? Welcome to opening act, scene 11, the final act.
Glad you guys are here. My name is Adrian. I have the honor of serving as the founding pastor here at <clears throat> Engage, and we are concluding our series uh, called Opening Act as we've looked through the book of First Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul writing to the church of Thessalonica. Uh, as we've learned, this was the, the church that Paul spent the least amount of time with, but actually it was a church that made such impact. And so well, as we close today, I'm excited to teach this. I preach this today with a very heavy heart because this has been one of the hardest sermons over probably the last, honestly, nine and a half years of me actually communicating to actually uh, to process and to be able to communicate. And so what I do and I hope, I want to pray before I start because what I hope to do is to communicate what it is that Jesus wants me to communicate today. Um, and so I want to do that. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for who you are. We say, come Holy Spirit. Father, I'm asking you today for you to give me, as every week, the words that you want to deliver, God. Anything that is said today that is not of you, God, I pray that no one will remember it, God. But I pray the stuff that is of you, God, it would go deep into our hearts. God, it is not the words of a man that changes lives. It is the power of your Holy Spirit. And it's something about the mystery of preaching the word that you do something, God. You do something to change the eternal state of individuals. So, Father, we're asking you to show up and for you to help us. We love you and we honor you, God. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. See, there's something about new love. Like, you know, again, maybe uh, some of you have experienced this, some of you maybe haven't, but that idea when you're in love, like it caused you to do stupid stuff, right? Like stuff that you never thought you would do that no normal human being would do. It causes you to spend money you don't have. It causes you to stay awake and like for long periods of time for no reason. It causes you to take dangerous drives to go see this person who you're in love with, even though you know you should be resting right now. But no, you decide to go for 48 hours and not sleep and then to drive back home. All right. Like stuff like that. It's just insane. And, and I think about that because I, I think about um, when I first started dating my wife, Wendy, and, um, and, and this moment happened. It was that, you know, it's that time where you're just getting to know the person. So this is back in the day. So for some of you, this is like, you know, it's going to feel like the 1400s, all right? But it wasn't, all right? It was actually not too long ago that um, where, like, you didn't have a cell phone, right? You actually had to pick up another type of phone, and you had to, like, call, and you had a calling card, right? And you had long distance. It cost you to call somebody, right? It wasn't free FaceTime. All right. You actually had to pay to do this. All right. And so I just started dating Wendy and I actually was I went to China to actually play. I was going uh, with a college tour of basketball. So I was in China, but I was in new love. So I didn't care. So I was in new love. Why? You got to know the person. So Wendy and I, as I'm in China, are talking to each other. And not just like, hey, I'm doing good. Played well last night. This went great. Blah, blah, blah. Wasn't that. No, no, no. It was that stupid love conversation. No, you hang up. No, 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 no. You hang up. What are you doing? Same thing I was doing 30 minutes ago. <laughs> what are we going to name our first kid? Like, I mean, crazy, stupid stuff like that, right? Like, I mean, it was like that new love that was just idiotic. And these phone calls were not like 10 minutes. Y'all, these phone calls were like two hours. I'm in China. dumb. Fast forward, you got this magic thing at the end called a phone bill. <laughs> and I'll never forget Wendy's father asking her, who are you talking to and why? Because their phone bill was like $800. <laughs> but here's the thing, and that's the thing, it's like, why are you calling? What's the point? Why are you talking to this? Like, I don't even know who this dude is. Why are you talking to him? Spending $800 of my money, right? Like, of my money spending talking, and I know it probably was dumb. Like, I know. I, you know, I think I'm a father now. Like, I pay my kids' bills. Back then, I wasn't thinking about that. Right now, if one of my kids did that, like, her father was incredibly gracious. Like, it would have been on site for me with somebody, right? If that would have happened. But here's the thing. But for me, you want to, like, what? why are you calling? Why are you talking? What were you doing? Like, see, the why was important because there was something about her. There was something. It wasn't just, yes, it was new love, but there was something. I wanted to know her. There was a why behind it. See, because your why manifests itself in life. Why you do stuff manifests itself. You can say one thing. But why you are doing it, the real intent eventually will play itself out in the streets. It will eventually play itself out. The why behind it for me, I wanted to know her. 
And see, I've been thinking a lot about this idea of the why. See, Simon Sinek, famous, he's a, a business consultant, thought leader, had, has one of the most uh, viewed uh, YouTube videos of all time, and really it's the idea about the power of why. See, Simon Sinek says that the, those companies that are transformational companies are those who actually promote and lead from their why. They're not trying to sell you a product. They're trying to sell you a vision. They're trying to sell you when they do that. So he says Apple is a prime example of that. He says why Apple has this cult-like following. Why? Because Apple is not about, oh, here's this new iPhone. It's they're trying to sell you this purpose. That's why they lead out of that. The Wright brothers, from the first idea of flight, they weren't the first ones to go after flight. They were the first ones to make it. But it was a why behind it. See, your why matters. The why of why you do the stuff that you do matters. The why of why you parent your children, how I parent my children matter. Are we parenting our children? Are we teaching them? Again, you know, you come to church, are you teaching them in the ways of the Lord because you know that's what God's called you? Or are you doing this because, man, they're going to behave and I'm going to look better? Your why will play itself out. Your why will play itself out of, in your marriage and your why will play itself out at work and your why will play itself out in friendship. It will play itself out in your political affiliations. Your why will play itself out. And why this sermon was so hard for me to come up with is because of what I have to say today. But I have to read something to you first. First Thessalonians 5. This is at the end of the letter. Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus comes again. God will make this happen. For he who calls you is faithful. So in the, this passage at the end, Paul, this is Paul's prayer. So the ending of it, a lot of times Paul would begin his, his, his letters with prayers and, and, and in some, at some point in the beginning, and then at the end he would end it with prayers. And this is a prayer. And what Paul is actually saying is what he really was talking to his disciples about, the idea of what Jesus talked to his disciples about, about this idea of God keeping them, the idea of sanctification, that man, that the peace, that you will be holy in every way, that mean, the idea of holy, that idea of peace, this idea of being together, of wholeness, and make your whole spirit, your soul, body, be kept every part of you, to kept blameless, the idea of Jesus, progressive sanctification. And so as I was getting ready to prepare for this, this idea of progressive sanctification, what that is, that's becoming more and more like Christ. And what he ultimately says is that the one who's faithful, the one who's telling you, who called you to this, he will remain with you. But I was sitting there and I was praying, and I'm like, God, I, I don't, I don't want to talk about this anymore. Because I'm trying to figure out what's the point. I'll just be honest with you. I'm like, what's the point? Like, I don't want to preach another sermon to you about your own personal progressive sanctification, your own sanctification. We talk a lot about that here. And there's been this thing, and so I was like, man, that's just me. You know, you know I, I think a lot about different things. So I'm like, I just, God, I, maybe I'm just trying to be too creative, whatever. And I kept thinking, kept thinking. So what I end up doing in these moments like this, I call people who, who actually help me through these process. So I call my, my friend, really like my OG, Pastor Tim Johnson. It's like, Pastor Tim, will you help me walk through this? And he was like, no, no, no. And I kind of tell him what I was going through. And he's like, no, you're feeling and sensing what actually is, is right. And he's like, I think you need to say what you need to say. Because here's what I want you to say. Is I can be very honest with you. Most of us, most of us are why behind Jesus and our why behind this sanctification, our why behind coming to church. Our why behind why we do this stuff is this is that you just want Jesus to co-sign your life. That's it. That's it. We just want him to co-sign. We want him to co-sign what we want. And what we want is this. And what we'll say is this. Yes, Jesus, I'll do all these things for you. But I need for you to co-sign this. I need for you to co-sign what I want for my life. I need to become more like him so that in our own minds, we have this thing where I want to become more like him. I know Pastor Adrian talks about that, man, our behavior, like, yes, it should be an overflow of our lives, but I got to behave so he can give me what I want. See, we want progressive sanctification because you want Jesus to give you this American dream. And let me tell you this, you can get the American dream without him. Just go work hard. But see, this is the thing, because at the end, and unfortunately, even guys like me, and I have to repent to you, at times we've made Christianity so much about us, that it's been about us. It's been about the stuff, but what can God, and, I, and yes, God, I want to be a blessing to people and do all those things, but at the end of the day, God, I want this, and every sermon is crafted for how it impacts every part of your life, but at the end of the day, here's the point. I want to ask you this, and I want you to forgive me. Some of you may never show up, but I want to ask this question. Why in the hell do you serve him? Oh my God, you said that. Because here's the point. The life of Jesus, it's not. The end goal 
of your Christianity, if it's you, then we've missed it. Good. And here's the thing about it. I am saying this to you not because I figured this out. As I was going through this, I began to realize in my own life how much at times of my life what I do for Jesus is based off what he's doing for me. And many times, it's not because we have evil intent. It's not like you're rubbing your mind right now saying, you know what, God, I'm about to deceive you. God, I want to manipulate you right now. No. Good. We're not. People, like, you're not. And I want you to hear that from me. I don't think you're like some evil human just in your head, like, you know, I'm about to just, I'm just God, you give me what I want, or I'm just, man, giving you the middle finger. No, we don't think that or say that, but we do that, though. And what we've lived in is a, this illusion of Christianity. And we wonder why at times we, we're still tr- we're troubled and, we, and, and the, 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 the torment and all the stuff that happens. And it's because at times, it's just at the end of the day, it's about us, it's about us. Again, even today, listen, I'm a huge person, proponent of therapy, a big pro- proponent of therapy. Like I believe, it. I've seen the benefits of it. Like I've seen the benefits. But here's the problem that's happened with therapy and even how it's creeped itself in the church. We were talking about therapy way before it was a wave, okay? So please go back, all right? Like I got, like, I got receipts on that one. You can go back to like 2013, 14. We was on this way before everybody else. But here's the deal though but like but here's the point of why i'm saying this where it's gone and where it's bad is this is that everybody's therapeutic stuff is about you getting liberty and freedom for yourself and it never has anything to do with the fact that once you get free you are getting free for other people so why we stay stuck sometimes is because we're not getting better for others we're getting better for self and here's what will happen therapists it's funny because therapists tell me this like, at the end of the day, like, most therapists, like, are not very good. That's the first thing. So, go talk to good ones. They'll tell you they're not very good. Here's the second thing, too. They just continue to perpetuate your stuff. Why? Because you get paid for it. Like, you get paid for it. And that's, listen, and I'm saying this, somebody who's one of the closest people in my life, who's really good at it. But that doesn't say that everybody else out there, that this stuff doesn't happen. And here's the point. And here's what happens at church. We just perpetuate this for you. We just let us talk about your stuff over and over again to make you become dependent and needy on us. Why there's so much programs and things in churches, why? It's because it allows you to be dependent on us instead of actually living out the gospel and going and being a blessing to the world. Like, listen, if you're going to be here and you're not wanting to do this and you're not wanting to go anywhere, you're going to hate it. You're going to hate this place. Why? It's because I believe what we have met morphed and made does not resemble at all what God has called the church to be. So here's the point. Why are you calling him? Why? And why does he call us? The first thing we have to remember is this. He's incredibly faithful. Like, 2 Timothy, let's read this. Like, I don't get this. Like, I may give you one chance, maybe twice in my broken codependency, that I'll stick with you. But though, if you're constantly unfaithful, if we are unfaithful, he remains faithful. He cannot deny who he is. Oh my gosh, this is a, that he literally is now in us. So we now have the spirit of God for those who believe. We are now part of his family. He cannot deny himself. Even when we're idiots, he cannot deny himself. That's unbelievable to me. The fact of the matter that before God calls us out, the fact that he knows that I'm going to mess up, the fact that he knows I'm going to do this, but yet still he's going to remain faithful to me. Are you kidding me? What kind of God is this? What kind of God would say that? Why? And it's this reality that we see it from the beginning. That when the, our first parents messed up, he sets in motion what he's going to do. That I'm going to crush the head of the snake. And he's going to strike the heel of this servant who's going to come. And he's doing it for us. And even when Adam and Eve were idiots, what does he do? He sacrifices an animal to cover them. Showing what Jesus would do for us. That by the shedding of his blood, he would cover us by his blood. Let me tell you this right now. 
why you can walk in confidence as a follower of Jesus, it's not because you're that freaking good. You're not. It's because he's that good. And that he drives you. Because let me tell you this. Everyone in this room knows that God has blessed you even when you've been in the season of being dumb. And that trips me out. But yet and still, we still play the game though. Right? Man, I got to behave so I'm going to get my blessing. I got to behave so I'm going to get my blessing. And he's been blessing you when you've been in sin. See, like pastors don't want to talk about this. Why? Because we got to keep you on the hamster wheel. We got to keep you on the hamster wheel of behavior and performance. Because why? Because that's just stick. But realizing this, and it's not saying because it's what Paul writes in Romans. In Romans 6, he talks about this. That if you continue to sin, thinking, man, I'm still going to get blessed regardless, then you don't understand the grace of God. Because when you understand the grace of God, the grace of God that is unmerited favor is the reason why you should serve him. It's the reason why you should be obedient to him. And some of you keep chasing this stuff. You keep chasing it and you're like, and he still does it because he's faithful. Not you, not me. Now, why does that matter? It's because when we go through trying times, he's still faithful. <laughs> oh, like to all like my, like my crypto bros out there, like FTX, just you know, all the stuff that happened this week, cryptocurrency, you know what? He's still faithful. Russia, Ukraine, still faithful. Midterms didn't go the way you wanted to, still faithful. Bank account don't look a certain way, still faithful. Sickness in your body, still faithful. Kids behaving like morons, still faithful. You're a moron, still faithful. <laughs> like he's still faithful. And it's unbelievable to me that he's still faithful. And so why should that cause us to live in a way? Because now when you understand that, when you're going through stuff, it doesn't mean it's not hard. It doesn't mean you shouldn't mourn. It doesn't mean you're not going to have sadness. It doesn't mean you're going to have highs and lows. But what should anchor you in the midst of an uncertain time is a certain God. He's just certain. I can tell you that. 25 years of serving him, he is so certain and faithful. He is. But here's the thing behind it. See, I could have preached a sermon and done all this and everybody could have responded and yeah, I'm in sin and I need to repent, whatever. Like all that, it's fine. But see, this is the point today. What's behind that? That's great, he's faithful. But why? Like, he's faithful because of who he is, but now for us. Like, why are we calling him? Because see, in the end, if it's just God, do this, give a blessing. Listen, he, let me just tell you this. Like, being really clear for God to be a blessing to you, like being a blessing does not mean that your life's going to go easy. That's never, it says that. Because trust me, watch the people he blessed in the Old Testament, New Testament, their life at times still sucked. But you know what though? They still were a blessing. See, here's the point behind it. Why God calls you, he calls you to be a blessing. That's why we exist, to be a blessing. Now, to understand this, that word, to be a blessing, what does that mean? We see at the beginning, Genesis 1. That God bless, he blessed the animals to be fruitful and multiply. We see the word, to bless means to flourish. Like what God wants to do is he's called us and he puts humans here on the planet to go and to be a blessing. To go and to see flourishing happen in the lives of individuals. See, that is why we exist. Why God has you here. Why he wants to see you be who he wants you to be. Why you're called to walk in progressive sanctification, be more like Jesus. It's not at the end. Listen, yes, it is about you, but it has nothing to do with you because actually in the end of it, you're actually called to be a blessing to others. That is what he has called us to. That is the point of this. That is the point of this church. That is the point of the declaration you heard. If at the end of the day, there's a bunch of people sitting in here and our city is not touched and the people around you are not touched and the people around you are not better because you are in their lives, we have missed the point. When you read the Bible and you all the people who study scripture and do this, but yet still what we fail to realize is that when they saw a need, and that, is, that could be physical needs, that could be social needs, economic needs, there were the people of God willing to go to be a blessing to the nation. That is why we exist. When we say innovative reconcilers, that's what it means. To go to be a blessing to the nations. And you know what those nations are? The place where God has put you. That's the nation's. Because if you cannot bless the place you're at, you're not going to go bless Africa. You're not. Because all that is is performative. It's performative art. If you can't get it done where you're at, you ain't getting it done over there. 
Well, I just need to be in a new environment. I just need to be in a place where they can see my gifts and talents. Are you kidding me? The apostle Paul was in jail. And what does he do? In stinking jail, he's still a blessing to the nation. He pens letters. Almost like two thirds of the New Testament. Majority of it, he's in jail. In prison. Not in the right environment. Under the right leadership. He's just pinning and writing. Why? Because who he was, the life of Christ overflowed. Some of you don't do nothing. It's because if you actually put yourself out there, we're going to see if it's really there. Because see, alive is just talk to me. Go do something. Well, on, pastor. I thought you said it's not about works. It's not. I'm not talking about salvation. But if your faith is real, I know about what you do. That's good. That's the word. <laughs> about what you do. Well, are you just, no, no, no. If it's real, no, that doesn't save you. But if you are, the work shows it. The work shows it. But is it about you? That you're waiting for God to unlock your calling. I'm just waiting for him to unlock my calling. Really? Because he calls you. Once he calls you, it's go time. Wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, to be a blessing. And we see this in Genesis here we go. You guys knew what was coming, but not Genesis 1 and 3 today. I already talked about that. Genesis 12. <laughs> the Lord had said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family. Go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous. And you'll be a blessing to others. <laughs> go back. Go back. Run that back there, Bo. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make you famous. Boy, we take that. Boy, I knew it. <laughs> I knew the Bible talked about me being famous. This TikTok dance about the pop coming up. <laughs> and you will be a blessing to others. The first part came because of this last part. He wants to bless you. He wants to do those things. Why? So that you can be a blessing to others. Here we go. Next one. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families of the earth will be blessed to you. So here's what happens. Through one man and one family and one nation, the world will be blessed. Because what God was doing was actually going back to the beginning of creation. Why? Through one family, through one man, Adam, and through his family, he would bless the nations. Genesis 3 happened, sin entered the world. The curse came. There was no such thing as a curse prior to Genesis 3. The curse entered. And here's what a curse is. Some of you think a curse, well, oh, man, God struck me with a sickness. I'm cur-. No, this is what a curse is. A curse, many times when you see in the Bible, is God turning humans over to themselves. Wow. That's it. See, we make it sometimes like, man, you know, oh, man, I, got, I got the flu. Boy, God, man, I knew I messed up last week. God's cursed me. No, no, no. This is when God has cursed you is when you live in a way and you don't care about it no more. Mm-hmm. He's turned you over to yourself. You don't believe me? Go read Romans 1. Mm-hmm. Their hearts become hard and they do whatever they want to do in their own sight. Oh man, because we've lived in God's curse. No, 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 no. God's turned humans. The things we see in our country, he's turned humans over to themselves. And here's the dangerous side. Some of us are so arrogant to see, man, it's because of this group, the nation's curse. No, it's because of all of us. Yeah. And see, he tells us that. But then God doesn't stop. We see this faithfulness that through this one man named Abraham, he shows up. And he says, I'm going to bless you. And that flourishing. And so here's what happened with Abraham. Abraham let, and listen, Abraham, you guys heard me say this recently. Abraham like lied. And in his lie, this is what's crazy about God. In Abraham's lie, God blesses this man with more stuff. I'm like, I don't get that. Because see, the point, see, we make, we make the end goal of blessing material things. It's not. So if we get material things, we think God's, but now, is that a sign of it? Yes. But is that the fullness of God's blessing that he's fully blessed? No. Some people just got the ability to make money. Some people just got the ability to make money. It's a gift from God. 
Are there moments where God shows up in abundance? Yes, absolutely. But here's what I'm trying to say is that the point of material possessions and all these things are what it's at the end of the day, you've missed the point of blessing. See, to be a blessing is to go into flourishing. And so some of you are saying, man, well, you know, pastor, listen, I don't have a lot. So how can I be a blessing to the nations? Wherever God has placed you, whatever he's put in your hand, he has given you enough because what he will do, if you put that before him, if you lay that before him, watch him multiply whatever it is that you have. So right now in the classroom as you're teaching, here's the thing, God, I don't have this, I don't have that. Give God what you have and watch him begin to multiply. Watch him begin to do that with those students. God, I don't have this at my job. God, I can't help. I don't have this influence. Begin to do what God has called you to do. Begin to be excellent in what you do. At the best you can with who you are, and put it and watch God begin to do something there. God, I don't know what's going to happen to my neighbors. Well, what do your neighbors need? Where do they need service at? What happens? What are the things right in front of you where you can go and say, I'm going to be a blessing? Maybe for some of them right now, man, they just need encouragement. Well, God, I don't have that much. Everyone in here, you got a word of encouragement inside you, go to someone and bless them. Good. See, we keep thinking that if I have a bunch, then I can bless. And God is saying that take what you have and let me use that because when you're faithful with little, you'll be faithful with more. Yeah. See, we read that stuff and we quote that stuff until we actually have to be the one with little. See, why I love this idea of this church is this. 18, you heard it, 18 people, $10,000 is what? We had little and God blessed it. And it wasn't because we were perfect. And it wasn't because, man, we didn't have any drama. It was none of that. It was the fact that in our hearts and our souls, we wanted to lay down before God what we had and watch God do something. Because we wanted to be a blessing to this city. And what is God doing? Because listen, I want you to understand this for the future of this church. This church and where it's at, understand it's the smallest it'll ever be. Where God is taking us, you know what that's going to look like? It's going to be for some of you having to lay down certain things of your life to go. See, it's great to hear that in a declaration until you're the one that God calls up to go. Pastor, I love what you do. I love, man, we go eight, all the state, eight states in the Southeast. I love it. But what if God's saying, you're going to Tuscaloosa, Alabama? Oh, no, dog. Mm -mm. I don't believe in it like that, though. I don't believe in that declaration. Mm -mm. I believe in Declaration of Independence, not that declaration right there. <laughs> like, what if? Like, you know what I'm saying? What if that God begins to say, don't you? Or what if that's beginning to God to say for you? That you may not go, but financially you're going to pour in. And that may mean for you have to sacrifice it to get, well, oh, I do my part. No, no, no. What if that is what God has called you to go do? What if God is saying, oh, man, I know, listen, that I'm going to serve you this. What if God begins to call you to do these things? Are you willing to go do it? Because, see, when it's called to be a blessing to the nation, it's not with all these caveats. It's willing to go. Abraham, God, you're telling me to go. And it said that it was credit to Abraham as righteous. Because why? God told him to go. Abraham lived in Babylon. God called him to go to a land he could not see with his physical eyes. He was a man that was late in his life and said, you're going to be a great family. If anybody had any reason not to believe God, Abraham did. But it was credit to him as righteous. Because he was willing to touch and believe. He was willing to believe God. And so here's the question. Will you go? Will you be a blessing to the nation? Why God wants you to be free? Because listen, the sin that keeps you locked up, the stuff that you're doing that you know is not right, he wants you to be free. Why? It's because when you are living, it tangles you up. You're constantly battling it. You can't go. You live in this place of these of back and forth, and these conditions, these things, you can't move forward. And then on top of these things begin to take you to places you shouldn't go instead of going to be a blessing. Instead of being a blessing to people, you're caught up. Why God wants you to be free is because he wants you to be a blessing. Why he wants to see you get delivered, why? It's because he wants you to be a blessing to see other people that happen to them. Because see, when you are living in a certain way, how hard is it for you to actually speak blessing and encouragement to someone else? Why? Because we, we're like, man, can I say that? I know how I'm living. See, God wants you to be free because there's blessing that you have for others. That's the freedom. That's the freedom. Listen, I need you to hear this. Some of you right now, you're in places to where some of the greatest work for Jesus is happening right now and you're missing it because you want to be somewhere else. Wow. It's such where you're at. Listen, some of you, you keep asking God to show up and God's saying, I am here. I need you to shut the door. Let me tell you this. If you feel called to leave, go. God's like, a, he ain't like this red light dad all the time. Y'all think he is. But y'all want all these, we don't want all these caveats to go. God, if I go, I got to have this house. This person got to go with me. All these things. No, if you're called to go, go. 
Let me tell you this right now. When we planted this church, I was hoping that somebody would get behind this thing. But please understand this. I told Wendy, I don't care if it's me, you, and our kids. We're planting this church. Shut the door. Coming back to this city. I want to be back here. Like, I must be real. Like, I love, I love this place now. Like, I, I get real offended now. I get real offended. You talking about Tallahassee? Hold on. Let me talk about Tallahassee like that. I feel like you're talking about my mama. Let me talk about Tallahassee like that. But I had to fall in love with this place. And I fell in love with this place because this is where God called me to be. But here's the thing. What are you doing with where you're at? Are you being a blessing? Husbands, are you a blessing to your family because you're in it? Or are you a curse because you're in it? Are you a blessing because you're in it? How are you encouraging your children? How are you disciplining your children? How are you encouraging your wife? Why are you doing the things you do around your home? Are you doing it because, again, at the end of the day, man, you just, you're trying to keep the peace? Are you doing it because as a leader of your home, you're trying to be a blessing? For why is this? Are you being a blessing in your home today? Are you being a blessing as a friend today? Are you being a blessing? When you go to work, <clears throat> When you go to work, does your boss see you as a blessing or a curse? Wow. Some of you, you're a curse to him. You don't add any value. You're a curse. Oh, I'm, I'm sanctified, saved by the, You are. And you're going to heaven, but you're a curse right now. Wow. You're not helping them. See, this is where we have to get all the spiritual stuff out because we keep it way up here. The down to reality. We're blessing and cursing. We're going to be a blessing to the nation. God's going to put godly leaders. No, 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 no. Are you a godly leader? Wow. Stop trying to wait for Donald Trump or for Joe Biden to be godly and you become godly. Yeah. So start being that so that you can be a blessing. That you can be a blessing to this city. You can be a blessing to where God has you. He's like, Pastor, this is kind of rough. It is because why? It's because we've lived under an illusion. What I hope this Holy Spirit does it is to wake you out of the stupor that we all have been in, that Christianity is about us. Yeah. That we would actually go. See, Abraham goes, and what does God do? And this is how God works, and it makes me mad, but he does. Abraham goes, and then he gets the blessing. He gets the son, and then God says, kill him. What is wrong with you? And he goes, why? Why does he say that? It's because when we get the blessing, it now becomes us that we're going to take care of it. And the one who gave it to you is the one who's going to steward and take care of it. We just have to be faithful where he tells us to do with it. He said that Abraham even reasoned in his mind that he'd never seen it, that God would raise him from the dead. And then Abraham goes in his line, line. Here's the thing. And we see in moments where Israel were a blessing, and we see in moments where Israel were living under the curse. And here's how this all plays out. One of my favorite passages, again, I say that a lot because I just love the Bible, so there's a lot of favorite passages, all right? Galatians. Three, in the same way, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. The real children, like children of Abraham then are those who put their faith in God. What's more, the scriptures look forward to this time when God would make the Gentiles right into sight because of their faith. But God proclaimed this good news to Abraham long ago when he said all nations will be, a, will be blessed through you. So all who put their faith in Christ shared in the same blessing Abraham received because of his faith. Now let's keep it up there and stop there. So here's ultimately what Paul's writing. Because of Jesus, Jesus comes from a line of Abraham. Our belief in Jesus now falls us into the blessing of Abraham that we see in Genesis 12. See, before it fell to the Israelites. If you were, if you were born Jewish, and we are all in this room, unless you're, unless you're Jewish, we are all Gentiles. But our belief in Jesus now puts us in that same blessing, but also with the same responsibility as Abraham, that he will bless you to be a blessing. And so falling to Jesus, you know, have you ever read Matthew chapter one? Most of you have it. You skip over it. You, just let it, you play it on audio Bible because the genealogy of Jesus. But why that was so significant is because the... For 400 some years, you don't hear anything. No word from God. But see, when Jesus comes up and see, when they begin to write this, they wanted people to know this is a sign of his blessing, that God's faithful to steal with him. Why? Because in his genealogy, you see, he comes from, man, I'm going to bless the nations. He comes from the line of David. You get to see in that genealogy that God is still faithful to his people. 
But see, but for us to be blessed and for us to be a blessing, someone had to be cursed. See, remember Genesis 3, a curse came into the world. And a curse has lived. And even we still see the, the reality of that curse now. But there had to be a penalty for that curse. And here's what it says. But those who depend on the law to make them right with God are under his curse. For the scriptures say, curses everyone who does not observe and obey all the commandments that are written in God's book of the law. So it's clear that no one can be made right with God by, tr- by trying to keep the law. For the scriptures say it is through faith that the righteous person has life. This way of faith is very different from the way of law, which says it's through obeying the law that person has life. But Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written in scripture, curses everyone who is hung on a tree. See, at the end of the day, I'm going to keep it a buck with you. Why I'm so passionate about this, when Jesus captured my heart, it was this. It was the reality of the cross. It was the reality of this, that there was this man named Jesus who went to a cross that lived this perfect life. And so the scriptures teach in one of the words is that he was our propitiation, meaning this, that on the cross, he satisfied the wrath of God, that God had let sin go unpunished. But on the cross, everything that was held back came against Jesus. That is why he was beaten beyond recognition. That is why you couldn't notice who was that on that cross. Because of the fact that the wrath of God came, but he was a perfect sacrifice. He was willing to stand in the gap as the wrath came and it satisfied the wrath of God. Because see, we see in Exodus 34 that he's a loving, kind, gracious God, but he is also a just God. And so sin had to be punished. And so God brought himself into human form, willing to die for us. What kind of man, what kind of God is this? And he'd be willing to hang himself on a tree Something he created, he made that tree and he was willing to die on it. And he did it for what? So that we could be blessed. So if you think Christianity is about you being blessed for yourself, you have missed the entire thing and you have missed Jesus. He has blessed you to be a blessing because that's how he lived. His entire life, he lived blessing those. Those who were sick, he made well. Those who were rejected, he accepted. And so what is the audacity of us to have all these rules and things that I'm not going to be friends with them or I'm not going to associate with them because of who they vote for or whatever. You have missed the gospel and you are missing Jesus. He has blessed you to be a blessing. And so here's the question of all of this. What in the hell are you calling him for? Today, Jesus, I don't care how long you serve him, wants to invite you onto this journey to be a blessing. So the question, will you? And so we're going to pray. And I'm going to give you a chance to respond to him. And guys, listen, I personally, my heart is that all of you will respond. But in the end of the day, it doesn't. God's will is going to be accomplished regardless. I just want to be a part of it. Some of you are just playing in the stance. Like you're just in the stance. I give the example all the time. Some of you think you're in this game. But it's like when I play video games with my son. When he was younger, he didn't know what he was doing. I would give him a controller, but it wasn't plugged in. Make him look like he was doing something. That's how some of you are. You're not in the game. It feels like you are, but you're not. Because you're not willing to lay down your life. And so Jesus wants to invite you into that. Father, we thank you so much for who you are. Here's my prayer today. If you're in here, you say, I want to go be a blessing to the nations. I just want you to stand to your feet so I can pray for you. Say, God, I want to be a blessing to the nations. God bless you and God bless you. Like this, I want to be a blessing. Listen, and I want you to understand this. Please do not stand if that's not what you want, because I am telling you this right now. I'm going to pray a prayer, and I believe God hears my prayers. And it's not because I am somebody and I'm, like, I'm some good dude. I am righteous because he was righteous, and now that righteousness has, has fell to me. And it's fallen to all those who are believers. So I believe that now he makes intercession on my, my behalf. Some of you, God is calling you to a greater level of sacrifice. Your Christianity is comfortable to you. And God is saying, you don't want you to be comfortable anymore. He's inviting you to not be comfortable anymore. See, if you are willing and able, I want you to open your hands and assign to receive. Father, I thank you. And my prayer is this, God, is that these people who are standing will be a blessing to the nation. The places you've placed them, God, they would be blessed. They would be better. They would flourish. 
Some places they're in need encouragement. Some places they're in God, they need real practical changes in systems and structures, God. Some, Lord God, they just need a high level of excellence. For some, God, they need a word of encouragement. Whatever it is, God, I am praying that the places that you've placed them, the nations that are before them, God, they would be a blessing to them, God. They would be better because of them, God. God, I pray you would give everyone responding strength to where they're going to have to die more. God, there's strength to where they're going to have to die more. Things that they may see, they've always hoped it would be. But God, you're showing them it's not what you've hoped it to be. It's something different. They would have the ability to die to what they want. God, I pray we would not be a church that's just looking for you to co-sign us. But God, we would say what is on your heart and let us be about that. Father, we repent for the times in our lives where we have lived for self, where we have lived for what we've wanted, for ease and comfort, where we've allowed our American dream, God, to filter in to God this thing of you and your kingdom. We repent. God, I repent. I repent of my selfishness, God. But God, what I am saying, I'm thankful that as we repent, you are so gracious to us, God. So Father, help this church be a blessing to the nations. Let this church be a blessing. We love you and we honor you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. If you don't mind staying to your feet, we're going to go into a time of worship. I want to encourage you simply this, though. We talk about Nehemiah Institute getting connected here. Why? It's because we want to help train and equip you to go be a blessing to the nation. So my encouragement is this. Go to concierge. If you haven't been a part of Nehemiah, get signed up. There's a new way we're going to be doing Nehemiah. You're going to be hearing more about how that's rolled out. But if you want to know the next step here at this church, that's where you go. At this time, I want to encourage you. Worship with us. As we sing next, here's the thing. As we talked about in our declaration 75 years from now, what will be the story they tell? Not only about this church, but what will be your story that you tell about him? We have a story to tell. Your life tells a story. And I pray that we would tell an accurate story of who this Jesus is. We hope that you enjoyed today's message. Now we are going to move into an opportunity to give of your treasure here. In case you miss all the different ways to give, you can head to engagetallhassie.com 